Hello everyone, my name is Nishant and I'm gonna be your instructor for the day. Now the main topic of the day is to understand what do you mean by agile development and how can it actually help different organizations to have better approach to deploying the application that they have. I've been working as a DevOps engineer with multiple development teams for the past 10 years. This session is being conducted on behalf of Edureka. Now the agenda for the day is a few very simple questions that you would need answered in order to actually make sense of what do people mean when they say that we are agile. So why do we need agile? What is even agile development? The key terms of agile, the advantages of agile, and how do you implement agile in your organization or the team that you're working with and the various methods, philosophies, and the frameworks that are available to actually implement Agile in the team that you have. So back in the day, there was something called as waterfall development or the waterfall model of development. So when I say waterfall, you can think about something like, you know, a banking application or an insurance application or some police department application. So the moment I say waterfall model, you can think of like a really huge application, which is, you know, made up of small chunks of code. For example, this application might have a front end. This application would obviously have a back end, and then it has some DNS routes and a few services that it's dependent on. So it doesn't really matter how many services are part of this application, but this entire application was shipped as a one whole application. That's how things used to happen back in the day. And this was referred to, or this method of development, the waterfall method, the application was referred to as a monolithic application. Now it's called monolithic, if I can write it properly, monolithic application. Now, you know, everything was fine in Dandy unless like 2000s and 2002. And that's when things started to become a bit extreme because the clients would have 10 different requirements that would change almost every day. Now, if you have one single application, you have a single point of failure. So if you were changing even this little part of this application, and if this part was to fail, this entire application would stop working. That's when people started brainstorming about better approaches to software development. And how can you meet the requirements of the millennium of the today's world without actually affecting how the software is written or any application is written in the first place? That's where the ideas of agile development came into the picture. So that was one part of the problem. The second part of the problem was because it was a monolithic application, the time that it required to actually push the changes. For example, let's say you have an application up and running in your production environment and your development team actually created a new feature or they modified the existing feature. Now that feature is supposed to go in production, right? but it actually used to take days and months back in the day because you would never really know what's gonna happen if you put it to production today. There are so many moving parts that you're never sure if it's gonna break the existing application that you have. So people used to actually schedule the maintenance. I'm pretty sure you would have received those emails, right? Like we will be unavailable during this weekend because there is a scheduled downtime. Now that's what used to happen. Now that cannot really fly anymore, right? Think about companies like Netflix, Uber, Amazon. They can't really be down even for a moment because you never really know how many people are accessing the service. Now that is the second part of the problem that people were trying to solve. That's when Agile came into the picture. Now Agile, put in simple terms, is a philosophy to rapidly deploy an application in much more organized way. Now obviously there's a lot more details than meets the eye, but in a simple sentence, that's what you mean by Agile. You want rapid deployment of the software or the code that you're writing without having to wait for a longer time. At the same time, you want to make sure that you have small chunks of code that can be shipped to the client or whichever application you're working with. That's the reason Agile exists today. And now we're going to look at what do you mean by Agile and how can you actually implement this? So I hope we are pretty clear about why was there a requirement of Agile to begin with. This is what you mean by waterfall model. Now this is the traditional software building practice, right? So you would gather the requirements, you would design or architect how you imagine your software to be, and then there would be actually coding that would be executed, 
there would be verification and there would be maintenance post deployment. So this is what has been happening for the past four decades, but this won't really fly in today's world because there are multiple changes being pushed every single day. So you can't really just go through the months of planning for a little change. So the way applications are developed have changed and so is the way applications are deployed. So that's what you mean by waterfall model. Now I think I have explained it pretty well. There are a lot of companies that still follow this model, but at the end of the day, all of them are trying to you know, migrate to a more agile development. It's not so easy depending on the size of the company, but you will still see a few companies using waterfall and they are in process of moving away from this model. Then comes agile to rescue. So what is agile? We've talked about the requirement or why does agile even exist so far? Now let's look at what do you mean by agile? So agile is nothing but a chain of rapid development and deployment, meaning the first section of your software development is always the planning part. But now you obviously know what you're about to build, but you kind of break that entire application down into small chunks of code. And then you work on those small services, one service at a time, ensuring that first of all, you kind of follow the microservices model. And at the same time, you don't really affect the entire application in general. So you plan, you design, you architect, and you actually develop the application, you test, you deploy it, and you review it. If you notice, launch is actually outside of this entire circle, meaning every time you make a change, it could be something as simple as just one line of code change, just a variable being renamed. So it doesn't matter how small or how big the change is. The idea is the moment the change is made, it has to be deployed even in a dev environment so that you can get a constant feedback over what's happening with the code that you have. Imagine if you actually had to wait for one month or two weeks just to get the feedback on if you really want that change or not. Now that could be a little annoying or frustrating from the developer's point of view. So that's the first aspect of Agile. You plan, you design, you develop, you test, you deploy the changes and then you review the changes before you actually launch them into production. The other major aspect of Agile is now, instead of working with like a huge chunk of application, you work in iterations. So when I say iterations, what I mean is you have a specific set of tasks that have to be completed in specific priority so that you already know what you're supposed to be working on and you are not really worried about 10 different microservices at the same time. You have a specific requirement where you should be focused. So you have the first iteration, which might be the first part of your application, second iteration, third iteration. So think about it this way. If you have amazon.in, if you're working for you know amazon.com or amazon.in, which is a shopping website, you might visit amazon.com and you might think, yeah, it's a one website. It's not really one website. It's a website that's broken down into several other services. For example, the website itself might be called a front end. Now, the moment you reach to amazon.com, you can click on a product, right? And then you can view the details of the product. So that service, it's not really a part of the front end anymore. That is being called from something else called as catalog. Now, once you decide that this is a product that I want to buy, you click on buy now and then it's going to take you to something called a shopping cart. And after you made the payments and all of those things, you have email notifications and you have text notifications. The point here is even though all of these things are working in synergy, they are actually completely separate services, completely separate tasks in the underlying architecture. So if I am working on something on the front end, I don't really have to be worried about the catalogs and the shopping because first, I'm getting a constant feedback even before the launch. I'm getting a feedback about what's going to happen once we launch your code to the production. At the same time, I don't really have to be afraid that it's going to break my entire application because all of them are developed as separate microservices. Your one service will never affect another service. Of course, the dependent services might be affected, but the idea is you never really want a single point of failure. That's the idea of Agile. Now let's move forward. Now, what are the terms and the values of Agile? So the first value is people over processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, 
customer collaboration over rigid contracts and responding to change rather than following a plan. So people over process and tools, this kind of gives you, you know, a development centric and client centric environment, meaning just because you've been doing something in a traditional way for the past eight years, it does not mean you don't really explore the options that you have right now. For example, whatever you did with PHP MySQL yesterday can also be done with Python and Flask today, right? I'm not saying change your entire application. What I'm saying is the model is pretty much people centric. The people like the development team and the customers and the end users are given more importance and working software over comprehensive documentation. Now, this is something that all of us would have noticed at some point in time, right? So every application would have an internal document of how long? 100 pages, 150 pages about all the classes, all the methods, how the application is being built then why the application is being built, who's the owner, and like plethora of other details that you as an individual is not even concerned about. You are concerned about what you have to build and how far along are you in that development task. So in Agile, the functional application is given much more importance than the documentation. Because if you think about it, the code itself is a documentation, right? If you knew how to interpret the code, you could look at the code and that can also act as a documentation. So I'm not saying there won't be any documentation. All I'm saying is the development is given more importance over the documentation part and then customer collaboration over rigid contracts and responding to change rather than following the plan. So agile is really feedback dependent, meaning back in the day, you know, the managers and the product owners will have multiple meetings. They'll come up with the kind of software that they want. Everything would be discussed over like three, four months, and then people would want to stick to the plan. Because you already spent four months planning this thing, now if you wanted to change even a little part of this, the entire meetings and planning would have to be done all over again. Now, Agile changes that. Agile works more on the feedback. Just because the plan has been made does not mean there cannot be any changes. Because you've broken things down into smaller chunk of tasks, any one of the tasks can be modified according to the requirements at any point in time. So these are the values that Agile bring to the table, right? So there are two parts of the puzzle. You have a benefit and then you have a value. So benefit is what you get like right off the bat and value is what you derive out of it. So what we saw before were the values where everyone you know, on the table receives some or the other kind of benefit because of Agile. Principles of Agile, satisfied customer, welcome changing requirements, deliver working software frequently, frequent iterations with stakeholders, motivated individuals, face-to-face -face communications, measure by working software, maintain constant pace, sustain technical excellence and good design, keep it simple, empower self-organizing team, reflect and adjust continuously. Now this might look more like a textbook thing, like here are the 10 benefits, you know, just go with Agile. But that's not really the case. We are actually gonna look at how all of this materializes, like, you know, over the future slides, when we actually talk about how can you implement Agile in the working or the team that you're working with. So let's move on. Now, advantages of Agile, we pretty much kind of, you know, touched upon all of these things for now. Persistent software delivery, increased stakeholder satisfaction, inspect and adapt, welcome to changes at any stage, design is important, and daily interactions. Now comes the meat of the entire presentation. Now you have a basic idea of Agile, right? But question that everybody has at any point in time is what's in it for me? Okay, you told me what's Agile and how can it help? but how can it help me as an individual or how can I actually implement Agile? So there are multiple frameworks or philosophies when it comes to Agile. So Scrum, Extreme Programming, Lean, Kanban, Crystal are some of the examples. The most popular one out there, it's called Scrum. Now again, these philosophies are not really set in stone. It's not like if you're following Scrum that, you know, it's 100% what Scrum dictates you how to do it that way. That's not really the case. In majority of the cases, what people do is they primarily implement Scrum and then they have some ideas from Kanban, Extreme and Lean. And then they kind of have their own philosophy that works for their organization. 
but Scrum is the one that's used by the majority of the people. So even before looking at the slide, you know, before we go through what we see in the slide, I can just kind of explain Scrum to you the way I know it, right? Because I've worked with multiple development teams, I've seen most of these being implemented and I know how each one of them work in a real world example. So what is Scrum? So Scrum is basically an iterative philosophy, meaning you iterate over the changes, you iterate over the deployments and software development one at a time. So if you wanted to talk about Scrum, Scrum is an iteration of plan, then build, then test, and then review. Now, you would constantly be iterating over all of these aspects. Now, what do I even mean by this? So let's first look at how or what does a Scrum implemented team looks like. So in Scrum implemented team, you have the very first person that I want to talk about, someone called as product owner. Now, when I say product owner, if you're coming from, you know, more of a traditional software development environment, you can think of a product owner as a manager. He is the guy who holds the responsibility to make sure that the application is deployed as and when committed. At the same time, the application is built exactly as the way it has to be built. So product owner is the guy with the ideas. He might not necessarily be a technical person. He might as well be a guy from the management. He does not necessarily have to know the development or the technicalities in detail. He's the guy with the idea and the owner of the application that would be developed. So pretty much all the accountability lies on him. And then there is someone called a Scrum Master. Now Scrum Master is someone that you would have traditionally referred to as a team leader or a project owner. Now you can think about Scrum Master as a team leader. In the hierarchical sense, this is the person that's right below the product owner. And this is the person who actually does the day to or handles the day to day operations like, you know, running the meetings or planning the tasks that have to be done. And then you have the team itself, which will consist of your developers and testers. And, you know, depending on your requirement, it might have a few more roles. But then you have the actual team who will execute the tasks. So these are the three roles that you have. But now that we know the people that are involved, how exactly this works? I mean, this looks pretty much similar to what you do at your office. It's just fancy names, right? You have a manager, you have a team leader, and you have a team. So how is it any different from what you do at your office? So that's what we want to look at now. I hope the roles are kind of clear to you. Now that you have the roles defined, let's look at the first thing about the development. So the first part of the development that we want to look at, it's called product backlogs. Now here's where things start to get a bit different from how you might have been working at a traditional environment. Now in a traditional environment, you have an application that has been already planned for months and you along with others have been working on deploying the application and you know the project usually goes on for a few months or even a year or two, depending on the size of the project. Now in product backlogs, you actually have the same application iterated over in smaller tasks. So when I say smaller tasks, you can think about the same Amazon.in example that we talked about. So the first iteration will have plan, it will have build, it will have test, and it will have review. Now in this case, I'm not really building the whole application. I obviously have an idea as to what the application is supposed to look like, but for now, let's say I'm only concerned about the front end or what the main or the primary website would look like. Then I have a second iteration where I would, you know, the same cycle, plan, build, test, and review. But this is where I'm actually working with email notification. I'm actually coding, how would my email notifications be sent out and, you know, how do you manage the email queues and the rest of the things. And then you have a third iteration, which might just be your payment processing. So in this case, again, the same cycle, you plan, you build, you test, and you review. But the benefit here is that once you have the product backlog, these are all your product backlogs. These are the things that are supposed to be done over a period of time. 
So the first thing you do is you define the product backlogs, not you as a developer, but the product owner and the scrum master. These are the people that would actually come up with all the backlogs instead of you know just one single application that says, I want this thing to work. They actually break it down into small chunks of code. So that is the job of the product owner and the scrum master. Because as I said, product owner might not be a technical guy necessarily. So scrum master is the one that would always be your technical guy, right? So both of them would come up with the product backlogs. Once you have a product backlog, there's something called as user stories. So each one of these would now be referred to as user stories and your scrum master actually ends up prioritizing them. Meaning if you have front end email payment processor, and 10 other backlogs that have to be developed, let's say over next five or seven months. In that case, the scrum master and the product owner would kind of prioritize. Now, obviously payment processor is of no use if you don't even have a front end. So logically, I would want to prioritize my front end over my payment processor. So scrum master and product owner will prioritize the user stories that you have. And depending on the priorities that has been set, they come up with something called a sprint backlog. Now sprint backlog is when your development team actually gets involved in this because now you already have an organized and prioritized user stories that you are supposed to be working on. So 10 different things are not just dumped on you at the same time. You are given a logical and reasonable tasks that have to be executed one at a time. And once you have the sprint backlog, you can actually start working on it as a developer. Now I'll get rid of this beautiful drawing that I've made for now. And let's just look at our sprint backlog. I'm sorry, I can't really, you know, write with my mouse, but I hope you realize it's called sprint. Now there are different, you could call them ceremonies or rituals, but there is something called a sprint planning. Now, the sprint planning, again, it's just a fancy name for the meetings and discussions that you have. During the sprint planning, the product owner will actually explain how he imagines the end goal or the product or the application to look like. So you have something called a sprint planning. You have something called a daily scrum. Now, daily scrum is nothing more than, you know, the 15 minutes meeting that happens every day where the developers and the testers and any other role that you have in the team can actually discuss what happened and where you stand. If you need any help, there are any blockades and what do you plan to do today or tomorrow? And then there is something called a sprint review. So sprint review actually occurs at the end of the user story or the backlog that you've been working on. So each and every one of these user stories, right? They usually are designed with the timeline of two weeks in mind. Now, some companies, the sprints may vary, like it could be two weeks to four weeks, but in majority of the cases, each sprint will last two weeks so that you know exactly what you're supposed to do for the next two weeks. Now, at the end of the two weeks, along with you know your planning, your daily meetings, once your sprint is completed, you have a sprint review where you actually demo the code that you have or you know just some kind of verification to make sure that sprint is actually completed and then you move on to a new sprint or you move on to a new user story that you have to work on so that's the idea that's how things work in general now with that in mind if we move on to the next slide this is what the scrum looks like so you have a product backlog and then you have a sprint planning now, as I mentioned before, each one of these sprints, the timeline is usually a couple of weeks. Depending on the size of your organization, it might last up to a month. But for all the companies that I've worked with, it's always been between one to three weeks. So you plan for what has to be done during the next two weeks, and then you have the user story or the backlog that you're supposed to work on, and then you have your team that actually works on it, along with the daily scrums. So you have the daily meetings at the same time, and at the end of the sprint, you have the review and then you ship the part that you coded. Now, when I say you ship the part, I don't mean you necessarily put it in production, but you know that the part is ready to be assembled into the application that you have. So the idea is at the end of every two weeks, you have a shippable part of the application that is ready to be deployed. 
So instead of working a huge application that would have taken a year anyway, now you kind of break it down into things that can be actually shipped in two weeks, depending on the priorities that have been set by the product owner and the scrum master that you have. That's the idea of scrum to break everything down into smaller chunks of code, smaller chunks of tasks so that everyone knows exactly what they're supposed to do. That's like the methodical part of it, right? You have a method. There is a specific best set of practices that you're following along with the technical side because you have a rapid deployment. The moment you write a code, you can actually test it in the dev environment. Now, that's where people like me, DevOps, come into the picture. But the idea is you don't really have to wait for a month just to see what you coded right now. If you push the code right now, in a matter of minutes, you would actually see that working in the dev environment. So that's the technical side. You have the instant feedback to figure out if you have to move on or you know if you have to make some changes to the code that you have right now. Now that's Scrum and Agile in general. Then there is a second method. So Scrum was one of the philosophies or framework. Then you have something called as extreme programming. Now this was one of the first ones. A group of developers came up with it back in 2001. I think the guy was called Kent. So they kind of came up with the idea of agile development. They came up with a set of best practices and then they even signed a manifest. So they actually came up with a manifest that, you know, these are the things that we should be following in the industry. These are the best practices and these are the principles and they even signed it. So extreme programming has been around for almost a couple of decades and Scrum is kind of the next iteration of extreme programming. It's a bit different, but as I said before, majority of the organizations use Scrum programming. So in extreme programming, they came up with, you know, the basic sets of principles like people centric environment, discipline, and then you have rapid deployment. So project requirements, stories, test cases, task completion, customer input, iteration planning. Now, both of these things are happening in parallel. So you have project requirements, you have stories, test cases, task and completion. And at the same time, you have customer input. And at some point, you have customer iterations in the meeting. For example, you developed 20% of the application and your end user or your client came back with a better idea or if they need some modifications. So those are the changes. Then you have your UAT testing, you have client side UAT testing and acceptance at the end of it. So extreme programming, the ideas are somewhat similar to Scrum, but at the end of the day, all of these philosophies are trying to make the lives of developers, the end users better and not compromising on technicalities rather making the shippable product better and faster is the idea all right let's move on then you have lean programming so lean principles even this has been around for a while so eliminate waste amplify learning decide as late as possible decide as fast as possible empower the team build integrity and see the whole yeah so you could call it a framework you could call it a philosophy or methodology now it really depends on you know the word that you want to use but at the end of the day, it's again trying to become uh, developer centric and people centric and setting best practices to make sure everyone in the team knows exactly what they're supposed to do. And you have a cross functional team. When I say cross functional, essentially, I'm pretty sure if you're watching this video is because you have some of the other development experience. And if you do, then you would have come across this point, right? When you talk to someone, hey, have you seen that feature? Have we looked at the code? And that guy would be like, you know, that code doesn't concern me. It's none of my concern. I'm working on something completely different. Now, we are used to that sort of development, right? Where people individually know what they're supposed to do, and they're not even worried about what the other person is doing. Now, it's time we actually break the silos just because you're not coding that part does not mean that the code does not concern the part of the code that you are writing. So everybody has to come together and work on the same application, which is what you'll call a cross functional team. In the Scrum example, once you have the user stories and the backlogs that you're supposed to work on in the next two weeks, it doesn't really matter what role do you play in the team. It's your team's responsibility to make sure that the task has been completed. And the task has also been designed with the timeline in mind. 
So it's not like you're expected to do uh, six weeks worth of development in two weeks. So the task itself is designed with the timeline in mind. And then you have something like Kanban. So Kanban is similar to Scrum. The difference here is in case of Scrum, you have you know, smaller chunks of backlogs that you're supposed to work on for the next two weeks or three weeks. In case of Kanban, it's a continuous process. So there is no such thing as sprint in Kanban. What you do in Kanban is you have a list of tasks that are supposed to be done. And for example, you have something like you know, a whiteboard. You have a build queue, you have a test queue, and you have a ship queue. Now, this is a hypothetical example. You would obviously have plan and the rest of the things. But the point is, you might have four things that have to be built, or let's just say three services that have to be built. And once the first service has been built, it actually moves on to the testing queue. And then this place is occupied by another service. And once this is done, this is moved on to testing, and this is occupied by another service. Meanwhile, if this testing is done, it will move to the ship queue and it will eventually be shipped. So the idea is whatever tasks have been achieved will be replaced by a new item in the queue. So if you have a build queue, test queue, and ship queue, all of these would be moving parts. So if your job is to build this, and let's say your colleague's job is to test this, the moment you push this first item into the testing queue, another item will replace this first item so that you know what is the next thing that you are supposed to be working on. So Kanban is more like a continuous implementation of the software development. So that's what you mean by agility in general. Even if you think about it, the English word agility means to be really rapid, right? Agility would mean whatever you're doing is happening in rapid successions, right? That's what you mean by agility in general. So in case of development, by bringing agility to your team, you're ensuring that everyone's happy at the end of the day, and you still have a technically smarter team that's able to get instant feedbacks. Now, I'll give you a quick example of this. Now, I'm pretty sure all of us, or at least most of us, are aware about Netflix. Now, you would be surprised to know that Netflix is pushing more than 1,000 changes every day into their productions. If you actually worked at a Netflix development team, you would know that these guys are pushing a thousand changes in production every day. Now, how do you think that's possible? Obviously, they are not pushing it to production without reviewing it or without testing it. Even with all of those things in place, how are they able to deploy more than 1000 changes every day? Now, these could be very little changes, like you know, some UI fixes, some database fixes, some payment processes fixes. So we are not really concerned about what the changes are, but I know for a fact that that's the number. That's the amount of changes that they actually push every day. That's possible because you mean rapid deployment by agility or by becoming agile. So that's the level of agility you can actually obtain the moment you have an organized team that is working on the principles of agile. Now, obviously there are external factors like, you know, how's your infrastructure, how's your DevOps team, but it is possible at the end of the day. And then there is one more framework that's called Crystal. So these are the ideas of Agile. Now, I hope I was clear into how can Agile help your team in becoming a better development team. So there are three aspects of it, right? Philosophical, technical, and the way software is built. So philosophical being the best practices, like how do you define your teams? Who's a scrum master? Who's a product owner? What's the team? What is a sprint? What are the tasks that you're supposed to do? Then you have the technical side of it. Like if you build a code, how exactly can you deploy the code? Like automatically, how can you review the code? How can you test the code automatically? And then there is a software development aspect of it that you're moving away from a monolithic application towards the idea of microservices. So these are the three aspects that move parallelly. And at the end of the day, it gives you a peace of mind. It gives your product manager a peace of mind and the end user a peace of mind with better ideas of deployment so that you don't really have to run around on 10 different desks confirming if your changes are actually deployed or not. So that's everything from me. If you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with Eddie Rekha. I'm pretty sure you'll find the contact details somewhere around this video. And thank you very much for your time.
you all have a good day and good luck bye i hope you have enjoyed listening to this video please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to edureka channel to learn more happy learning